I want to thank you all for returning for our second class in our eight week pandemic series that is entitled Pilgrim's Progress Through Pandemic from Coping to Adapting to Transforming. Mark, we think that today you're going to help us engage possibly all three of those <laughs> aspects <laughs> as your whole life, Dr. Mark Dennison, and you will tell us the story. For over 30 years, you have been on a journey of faith and persistent scientific research into coronavirus. Mark, dear friends, is a Presbyterian elder, member of Second Presbyterian Church. He is a world-renowned coronavirus researcher. Mark has recently, over these past months of pandemic, been featured in the New York Times, in the New Yorker, and in more scientific and medical journals than I can enumerate. As Mark shares with us about COVID-19, what we did not know, what we have learned, what we still have to learn, and what does faith have to do with it? This is to be interactive, but please let us remain muted. Uh, you can also utilize the chat function, but feel free to raise your hand. I'll be looking or just come on in. Okay, uh, thank, thank you, you everybody for, for, uh, for inviting me. Um, this is a, I'll, I'll say this is a, this is my first, I think the last uh, group, I had any interactions with people was sometime back in February when Second Place had a retreat, uh, right as this was initiating, and we were all together in person, right, right uh, as this was still not in, not obviously recognized in the United States. Um, there's of course so many aspects of this, and and I know that it, Im it impacts people. Um, you know, there's lots of things. Obviously, for me, this has been a a, a very unusual period of time. Um, it's something that we had been thinking about and predicting for the la at least the last 20 years and actually trying to prepare for. And we have, um, <clears throat> so I, so seeing this come to pass, thinking about this in terms of, um, you know, what the, what the impacts were and the preparations that we have been trying to do in terms of antivirals was something I was thinking, um, you know, of this is sort of an evolutionary event that might occur sometime in the next 10, 20, 50, or 100 years. It's sort of like preparing for a, you know, a, a, a level seven earthquake in, in California or something. You, you know it's going to happen. You don't know when. You're hoping it's not tomorrow. And, uh, and you do the preparations that you can do. I, um, I'll share my screen because I, I have a, a few things. And I promise I'll try not to take you too far. I'll, I won't take you down the rabbit hole of of um, I'll try not to take you down the rabbit hole of of uh, of, of virology uh, too far, and uh, if it let me know if you can't see this if you can't see the screen um, at all um, if if it's not coming coming through um, it, it's not necessary for people to try to understand what I'm doing in, in any case I, I guess there's some things and I and I'm using this as more of a thing for people to really build on and ask ask me questions as we go and we won't. Get through everything. That's not a goal today, but I want to give you some perspective on what we're what we're talking about. Um, I, you know, we hear so much and we hear so many things, and trying to understand it. So I guess I've I've just sort of thrown up some some questions. What is a virus? Why did this happen? What is my story? Why do I study coronaviruses? What were we doing before the pandemic? Where do we go from here? Will vaccines work? And and I guess I, I integrate more of the concepts of, of of faith and commitment into this and more. Uh, really is it's sort of wound through but i but i'm really honestly very happy to be interrupted with questions that are that you think are relevant or important um the first one sort of is is the concept of of what is a what is a virus and and where do these things come from and what do they do and what what do i think about them so i'll just give you a five or a five minutes or ten minutes sort of a background some of this will not be relevant to you some of it will fly a little high so uh, if, if I think about things, the, one of the easiest ways to sort of think about them is to think about them in terms of, of size. And I, and I put something here on the screen. I hope some of you can see my, the, the pointer that I put up here. Um, I'm going to turn this into a written. Um, if, if we think about something like a cell, yeah. a cell being, say, the size right over here of a human cell. It's a, a cell, if we think of it maybe as the size of a football field, a human cell. So like 100 yards long, filling up a stadium. Um, a, a bacteria 
then. If so in, in our cells, of course, we have billions and billions of cells in our body and hundreds of billions of bacteria in our body. But a human cell, if we think of it the size of sort of a football stadium, a bacteria that we are you know, covered with Another and filled with Another would be about the size of a uh, one yard, one yard. You. Okay, so it'd be about one yard on that football field. And if we think about viruses from the largest viruses like flu, influenza, physically largest, intermediate like smallpox and smallest like polio virus, these would be about the size of a soccer ball. So I tried to kind of, I tried to kind of do that here. If we have a, if we have a football, if we have a football field, and put a bacteria on the middle of it, and then we have a back or sorry, a cell filling up the stadium, and then a bacteria in the red outline here would be fitting oh. right on that. And then if a soccer ball would sort of be the size of a, of a virus. So they're inc incredibly small, they're incredibly simple. They just contain a little bit of genetic material and a, and a coat of some kind to be able to allow them to get into a cell. So what do they do and why are they able to sort of overtake a cell and are they over able to uh, do what they do? Well, I think the, the main principle is that they're able to um, get into a cell and really sort of take over the machinery. They're very simple genetic machines that get in and modify a, a, a cell. Um, if this was a, a coronavirus, what we call the life cycle, if this is an exaggeration of the size of a virus, if it comes to the, comes to the cell, it, it finds a thing on the, it's basically like a lock and key. It's got the key and on the surface of the cell is the lock. And that lock allows the virus to bind to the cell, take, go into the cell. And then once it's in the cell, that simple genetic material inside the virus now is able to begin to modify the cell inside and turn it into factories. It's sort of the equivalent of a truck backing up to a factory that's already in place. So say at the plants down in Spring Hill, they're making one car and then a, a truck backs in, a giant truck backs in and it's able to come in with people and machinery and sort of rearrange the, the assembly line. It basically takes over, turns uh, takes the assembly line over and now begins to make another car that comes out the other end. So instead of the cell doing its own thing, it's turned into a factory for viruses. And so why are they so good and so fast at what they do? Well, if one gets into a cell in our throat, if it's a good virus and it can grow, it can make a thousand to 10,000 viruses in, out of one cell. So their ability to amplify themselves is really dramatic. Why do we, uh, so when we think about that, why do we you know, survive them? I mean, why, do, why are human beings here? Why are animals here? Well, a vast majority of viruses are benign or they don't infect humans or they have, they serve incredibly important features. Uh, they actually decrease the, the, the virulence and damage of other organisms like bacteria and fungi. So they actually are almost all good. Um, if, if, if you take a, a, a one a teaspoon of seawater, there's about a hundred million bacteria in every teaspoon of seawater. Um, so when you're swimming, you can think about that, but they don't, cause disease. They don't infect humans. They infect other bacteria, they, other things. Uh, even coronaviruses, um, the vast majority of them have no interaction with humans at all. And why are we so able to survive them? Why over, why over evolutionary history have we been, been protected from them? Well, I think it's because really, you know, it's a, if we think of it like a battle, then we really have a lot of the tools that typically help us to win the battle and, and survive it all the time. Um, this is a complicated biological thing, but it's a, I could simplify it by telling you that for a virus to come from an animal, like a bat, and to get into a human, if this is a human, and yes. to get out and become a human virus, that it has to be able to do so many things evolutionarily. We sometimes talk about viruses jumping from one species to another, but they really don't jump. It's more like a, a thousand mile long high hurdles race with a hurdle every 10 feet. And those hurdles are all of our immune system and all of our evolutionary history and all of the physical barriers we have, all of the uh, inability of a virus to adapt rapidly enough to survive in humans. So this is kind of, when, when I think about context, I think about their potential is always very high, but the probability is always extremely low for a new virus to enter into humans. So why did we 
um, think about this and study this in terms of, of coronaviruses and, and, and what, what was the interest that we had? Well, I think uh, the interest that, that, that I had from the very beginning, um, I'll, 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 I'll pause and tell you my story, but I wanna make the point about what sort of driven my interest over the last 20 years. And that is that when I started working with coronaviruses back in 1984, when I was at the University of Iowa as a, a young fellow with much more hair, um, I, I was interested in them, I became interested in them because of their biology, not because they were really very important human pathogens. In fact, if, if there were four coronaviruses, which is crazy names here, I won't go through them, four coronaviruses that caused human colds, and that's all they caused. They just caused uh, respiratory infections. They gave you, you know, a runny nose or a cough or maybe a fever sometimes. And in some people who are immunocompromised, you know, had cancer or in chemotherapy, they might cause a more serious disease. Or in people who were in tight quarters, like military troops, and in, in, in you know, in um, in their in their bunkhouses, might get more serious illness and like pneumonia. But rarely did they cause death. And so then. In 2002 and 2004, through 2004, the SARS epidemic, so really less than six months, uh, SARS uh, emerged uh, from China and um, caused over 8,000 infections worldwide, 32 countries of really devastating disease and in, in some caregivers. Um, and, then, and then within four years, there was another coronavirus identified called MERS in Saudi Arabia and the Arabian Peninsula that that continues to cause infections and actually spreads from camels to humans, but probably started in bats. And then with SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, this. So this concept that we have accelerating emergence of what are called zoonotic coronaviruses. And what does zoonotic mean? Zoonotic means zoo, animals. It means that a virus has moved from an animal to a human. And so the concept that coronaviruses are accelerating in their zoonotic potential, their pandemic potential, the, the ability to cause virus disease across the world is really what, um, what was our motivating factor from the time that we started working with SARS and MERS over the time that I worked in here. And, and I worked with another model virus called mouse hepatitis virus. So why do we think that this was something that was something that we, we didn't predict SARS-CoV-2. Certainly we couldn't have imagined the, the implications for the world, but, um, but we, were, we had been predicting that a virus like this had the potential to emerge. And, and so what are some of the kind of some of the reasons we think about that in terms of, of viruses being able to spread? And, and then I'll, I'll pause and talk a little bit about the background. Um, I think one is what I call the ubiquity of coronaviruses. I think I can use that term now. And let, let me show you what I mean by that. Um, I, I don't have a, an, another, I have a, other schematics, but this is one that gives you a sense. This is just, these are, something that evolutionary biologists would use, which is called a phylogenetic tree. And this just shows the relationship of different coronaviruses. But the only point I want to make about this is if you look in the blue area, these are called beta coronaviruses, that there are about 100 viruses here, but it really represents the ones that aren't shown, which is a, a several thousand coronaviruses. And if it has BT at the beginning of it, that means bat. Okay, so that means that there's bat coronaviruses that are broadly spread throughout uh, the world. Um, and, and most of which uh, aren't known to cause disease in humans. But there's a few that we had shown and others had shown had the potential to cause human disease. And this is not SARS, it's not SARS-CoV-2, but there's MERS and there's, then there's human coronaviruses, there's a mouse virus that we work with, but these were all broadly spread and able to uh, potential for, for causing disease. There are coronaviruses that cause infections of dogs, cats, pigs, chickens, beluga whales, cheetahs, giraffes, pangolins, you name it, um, mongoose, they, they cause disease in humans so, or in those animals and the, and the question of potential. So when we thought about this in terms of the potential uh, risk of spread, um, we thought about that, you know, this ubiquity of coronaviruses and the fact that some of the bat viruses could be taken and put in to human cells and they could cause uh, infection. So then there's the issue of human intrusion into new domains, right? So humans are in, increasingly moving into these domains. They may farm animals, they may do farming of animals, which may be used for food or other, or other reasons that are able to act as intermediate vectors for, for coronaviruses to potentially spread to humans. 
Uh, certainly the rapidity of travel, I think we've seen this as an exceptional example with cruise ships and other forms of travel that have led to really the spread. Uh, social and political disruption. When I used to talk about this, I talked about it in terms of war or other disruption, which is of course important. Uh, I don't think I have to even do that anymore. I think human nature has taken over. Political division is now a, a driver of, of pandemic spread. It's stunning to me that that would be the case. And it's not one I ever would have put on my list that um, political division and mis misrepresentation of, of actual risk would be a cause of maintenance of a pandemic and could lead to the kinds of disruptions that we're seeing. So uh, this just gives you some of the senses of, of some of the areas and, and I'd be happy to entertain questions. Um, I guess the next thing I wanted to do was just talk a little a bit about, you know, sort of um, why did this happen and then what is my story? I, I think my, the, the, the data, I'm not sure we'll ever now get, we won't get back and get the big bang of which virus or which animal this came from. That data will, if, if it's available, it won't be forthcoming, it won't be released. I think in the political divisions that are occurring, we'll never actually get the full story about what happened and why this happened. Um, I still am convinced that this is a natural virus that probably led for someone's exposure in a cave uh, when they were um, hunting for some a animals, um, but they were you know, farming bats or getting bats for other purposes, and that someone had either a low level or an asymptomatic or maybe a serious infection, but they brought it back to a market and that that was the initiation of the thing. We don't need to propose anything else for this virus to happen. This virus was ready-made uh, with amazing potential, and it was just looking for an opportunity. Um, so I think that then I think we we all can track over the last eight months, we can track the kinds of things that would have led to its spread and to its um, presence and in, in, in its current the current situation that we're in. So let me I'm, I'm a, I'll pause there for a second and see if people have questions about what I've talked about so far. I, I don't want this to be a monologue. I prefer not to, but I but I'm happy to take questions on the chat. I have a can you comment on but I this says someone I wonder if that's Mary Basinger. Mary, would you like to unmute yourself and share your uh, con your question? How masks protect the user okay. versus how they protect others? Sure. Well, I think that there's a, I think that, you, you know, um, I think of everything in, in with, with viruses and virus replication and virus spread, it's, it's easy to think of everything in, in terms of what I call logarithms. You know, viruses think in logarithms. You get one virus in, you get hundreds or thousands out. Um, when we get infected, we will shed millions of virus particles. Okay. So what are the factors that would determine whether someone gets infected or not? Obviously, it's going to be uh, how, how many virus particles it takes to actually infect you. In some, in some coronaviruses, in animal, some animal coronaviruses, one virus particle is enough to cause an infection. So you can imagine if there's 10 million virus particles that, that, that are spreading, that that's a very highly infectious environment. We don't know the exact number for, for SARS-CoV-2 or co I'll just call it COVID, it's easier. Um, we don't know the exact numbers for COVID. But what we know is that every time you can reduce something by a factor of 10, you can reduce it, that the probability of, infec of infection will drop dramatically. Nothing I'm muted. And so what, what, what can a mask do in either direction? Well. You may not need to be protected from 100% of virus particles. You just may need to be protected from enough virus particles that are able to cause an infection. So you can imagine that if you reduce um, you reduce exposure to something that's in the air, that by just even even a physical simple physical barrier, that that may be enough to prevent an infection. I think from our place of protecting other people. There, there's a couple factors. One is that just that physical factor of droplets. So viruses spread by, it can spread by direct contact. So a mask can help by actually keeping you from touching your nose and your mouth. That's a, a, a dramatic way that we typically spread coronavirus, uh, the other known coronaviruses. They can help by physically blocking part droplets. So viruses can spread by hand to mouth, they can spread by droplets, which is the thing you see in those pictures of people sneezing, you know, and, and shedding out big volumes of stuff into the air. And they can spread by potentially binding up an actual particle that's in a small particle aerosol. So the little particle floating through the air, just hitting that physical barrier. Um, if any of you are, ever, are from the Midwest or from the Northeast or, or North or Northwest, you have experience with what are called snow fences. 
You know, a snow fence is something that's set up along the highway to, uh, in the case of a ground blizzard, the snow's blowing along and it hits that snow fence and it's just a series of slats. And that's just enough to cause turbulence and turbulence causes change in airflow and the snow drops. Okay, so a, a mass can work like a snow fence. It could act as, as you get air moving through, it basically causes that particle to just stop. Okay, and it doesn't have to be perfect. So it, it, it just has to be good enough. And good enough is defined by whether it works or not. And the evidence is that it does. And so I think that, um, I think that that's some different ways it, it works. And then finally, it just works by decreasing the area of movement of air. So I don't know if you all, have, it's, a, it's a simple experiment. It's kind of fun to do. Put on your mask, turn up, put a candle on in front of you and try to blow out the candle. You, you just cannot blow out the candle no matter how hard you try, no matter how simple your mask is. So the concept of just retaining stuff in an area that virus particles will drop to the ground, they won't remain airborne. So that's, I guess, the simple, I guess the simple um, the way to, to respond to that. Um, let's drop that... your... Oh, sorry, Mark. Yeah, go ahead. I was just thinking, let's go to Helen's question and then maybe back to Terry's. And I'd like to give some, maybe a little more background on Terry's from you. Helen's yeah. asking, can we get the same virus twice? That seems to follow along the um, mask question. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> With the known, well, I think that there's data so far with, with COVID that, in fact, reinfection is possible, although it's, unli it's unlikely and unusual. What do we know about other coronaviruses? What do we know about other cold, cold coronaviruses? Let's say there's two of them. I'll call them A and B. They're two different ones. In year one, I can get A. In year two, I can get B. In year three, I can get A again. In year four, I can get B again. Okay, so that's long been known. That was volunteer studies from the 1960s. That people could be reinfected, but but the issue. So the, this is some important. There's some important issues here, and maybe I should just make another slide and type some of them up. Um, if you guys are still looking at my screen, mm -hmm. um, um, if I if I think what are the issues that, that think about reinfection, or, or what are, what are, what is it we want from immunity? What do we want from immunity? Do we want to completely prevent this or do we want from infection? Do we want to completely prevent this from ever getting infected again? That's not a very, um, except for some rare things like smallpox or other things, the concept of never getting an infection again is not really as critical as what kinds of infections we get and do we spread disease. So for example, if I've had one coronavirus and then a couple of years, I get it, again, I get exposed to it. Or let's say I influenza, and then I saw the same strain of influenza. I might still be infected. Cells in my throat might still be infected, but my immune system will then limit that infection. So I won't get as sick or I won't get sick at all, but that will boost my immunity subsequently further. So I think sometimes we misrepresent the goal of a vaccine or even of natural disease is, is, is to prevent, entirely prevent infection. Um, it may be more important, a more important goal, particularly in the pandemic, to prevent de decreased transmission. So we're helping our community as well as we're helping ourselves to protect those who might die from an infection from maybe just getting a mild infection and recovering from it and boosting their immunity. So, or, uh, or potentially in some people who are very seriously at risk, immunocompromised or other pre-existing conditions, that they would be um, completely protected from having any kind of infection. So I think that those are those are all kind of different goals um, that we might have that we might have that might um, help us uh, with understanding what, what we want from immunity or from a vaccine. Um, I'm just going to keep going with questions and then we'll I'll fill in some gaps. Um, most interested in in last two bullets. Where will we go from here? And will and will vaccines work? And to what extent will vaccines work? Let me let me comment on that based on what I've just said. Um, I think the answer is vaccines will work. The question is, is what do we want from a vaccine? And I think I just covered some of those points. Um, I think we, we misunderstand um, what people want is they want something that's absolute. And there's very few virus vaccines that are absolute. So uh, smallpox is one that ten is uh, absolute. That's why it was eradicated as a natural infection. Um, we need some to be absolute, like if we want to have an HIV vaccine, we obviously want that to be an absolute vaccine that prevents people from getting infection. That would be a wonderful goal for coronaviruses, but typically that's something that can take years and years and years. 
my experience so far with these with the vaccines, and we did some of the original testing of people's blood from the phase one of the Moderna RNA vaccine, is that they're inducing very good immunity that looks as good or better than what people are getting with the um, uh, with the natural infection, and that that's lasting even in even in people my age and older uh, who are a little more at risk. Um, that the, that the immunity is good to, from the vaccine and it's lasting for months. Um, I was I was in the trial for the Moderna vaccine. I don't actually know if I got the vaccine, but what I do know is after the second shot a month in, I woke up at night with a, a, a fever and uh, not with a fever, but with chills and headache and nausea and aches and pains. And I nudged Laura in bed and I woke her up and I said, I feel terrible, I feel terrible. This is great. I think I must've gotten the vaccine. So, uh, uh, so. In fact, I think we sometimes misunderstand for them that, that in fact, you want a strong immune response and that that's not an adverse event and that's not a bad event, if I got it, um, that, that having a really strong reaction is a, is a good thing to the vaccine. I think that that implies that the, the immune response may be good and that may be partially protective. Th those studies are underway right now. The, the boards, the, the data safety monitoring boards will be meeting in the next several weeks to months as soon as there's enough um, infections with the overall uh, study cohorts, that would be people that didn't get the vaccine, placebo and the people that got the actual vaccine, that when there's been enough infections that occur to count and to see if there's a difference between the placebo and the vaccine, that those results will start coming out. So I think there's multiple ones that are, um, that have the potential for being, um, for being useful. Um, and I think for, for giving some form of protection, potentially decreasing transmission of people who do get infected. So I'm, I'm optimistic about the quality of the vaccines. You know, most of the time vaccine design is a 10 to 15 to 20 year, year project. Um, I think we need, to be, we need to be careful in terms of expectation or else we're going to uh, you know, kill the baby of warning. It's just not, just not good um, to do that. Um, so could we get the SARS, the COVID virus twice? I, yeah, I think the answer is going to be yes. There will be people that do that. If you had a very early mild infection, if your immune response is not substantial, then I think the answer is yes. The question is, is, is what does that mean in terms of your own disease and your own transmission? Um, let's see. Um, herd well, there's a lot, a lot herd, of questions. Herd immunity, I think is your next one, Yeah, Mark. yeah, okay. Um, so what we've seen, what we have all seen from, from um, in, before before COVID came out, right, we, we were seeing lots of examples of measles emerging right, in Anaheim, in California, and other groups of people who are non-immunized. Mm -hmm. But we know, what I know as a Pete's ID person, and certainly what my colleagues who study vaccines more than I do know, is that um, you have to make, uh, for some, well, for, for polio virus, for trying to eradicate polio virus, that in order to, to have a potential for preventing spread, for preventing reemergence of the virus, you need to maintain 70 to 80, greater than 80% overall immunity in the population. What does that mean? I mean, what does herd immunity mean? It means that if uh, if I'm in a group of if I'm in a group of 80 people or 100 people, that if 80 of those people are immunized and immune, and I come down with an infection, the virus doesn't have a path that it can follow. It's like the old ping pong ball, the old balls in the in the slot in the machines. Um, bouncing around from place to place from pinball machines that there's not a, a pathway. They're all exit pathways and it's going to be blocked enough that it can't maintain a cycle of transmission and reemergence in the population. How do you establish it? Well, typically herd immunity is established by a combination of natural infection and vaccines. In the case of polio, for example, for those of you who remember in polio, um, that's been done, that's done now exclusively by vaccines. And there was one vaccine, the live vaccine, that the live oral polio vaccine, the original Sabin vaccine, um, was able to actually, if, if I got the vaccine, it immunized me, but I actually replicated it and shed it in my stool because it was a live virus. And I could spread it. If I was a kid, I could spread it to, by the way kids spread things into the community. And that vaccine then would immunize more people than just the person who got the vaccine. And that was a way to induce um, shared or herd immunity in a, in a community. So if you could immunize 50% of the people, 80% of the people ended up with immunity. With COVID, um, 
this is a little different, obviously. There aren't any live vaccine, virus vaccines now, so there's not a mechanism to do that. So this would mean that you either had to have some number greater than 50%, but more likely 70 or 80% of people in the community who had some enough immunity to prevent them from getting infected if someone else in the community is infected. Um, it's, a, it's a concept that is, is one that we apply to viruses that we understand that already had broad immunity in the community, or there'd been 50 years to have a vaccine work to develop herd immunity. Um, it's a naive speculation for this virus. You know, even if there's been, uh, let's say there've been 30 million people in the US who have been infected, let's say there's, there's, there's three times as many as we think, and they've been asymptomatic. Well, 3 million is still less than 1% of the US population, right? 30 mil or 30 million is less than 10% of the US population. And that's assuming that they have good immunity. So uh, um, a herd immunity is a, is a concept that we should pursue scientifically and, and socially, but I'm, I'm, in my opinion, it's a, it's, a, it's a cruel strategy to apply as a default because it implies that we are just going to sacrifice people to the virus while we wait for this evolutionary to establish its herd immunity. You know, we don't have any examples. This is the first example in human history that I'm aware of, of a brand new virus coming into human population that's naive and novel into a naive population where everybody is at risk. And so um, we do not have a clue about how long the evolutionary trajectory of this virus will be from an epidemic pandemic virus to one that becomes like other coronavirus human colds. Um, it could be a year, it could be 20 years. And so I think that we have to think about strategies that's, that protect the most vulnerable among us while we're, while we're trying to get the science right and get established herd immunity if that's possible. Thrilled with, with everybody's engagement and yours right back at us, Mark. I think we have a medical, some, we have a couple medical folks on this, and I think it's the R uh, question that comes next. That, it, that means the reproduction number. That means if, for, for each person who's infected, if I'm in a room with uh, 10, 10 people, um, basically, if I, and I'm infected, how many people will I infect if I'm just, if I'm just interacting normally? That, that has to do with a couple of things. It has to do with the environment. It has to do with also the, um, the qualities of the pathogen itself. So for example, a measles virus or chicken pox, they have a really, really high R value because they persist and they float around in the air. And so one person in a room can, you know, if, if I'm in a room and I have uh, chicken pox or I have measles and I'm coughing with measles virus, I could probably infect everybody in the room just because that virus is so infectious and it floats through the air and gets there. Uh, I can enter a room later, two hours after someone's been in the room with measles or chicken pox, and I can get the virus if I'm, ex I'm, I'm, I'm sensitive to it. The R value, and typically people think if there's an R value is less than one, so or one or less. So if I can infect one person and that person can infect one person, that that virus is not able to maintain itself in the environment because it doesn't have enough capacity. Um, I think that 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 value means a lot. If it's, and so if it's 10 or it's two or greater than two, that's a virus that's able to exponentially, you know, two then four, then eight then 16 and 32. And after 30 passages, you can, you could infect a billion people theoretically. So um, that has a lot of value when you're talking about the initial outbreak. I don't know the value of an R reproduction number when you have virus that is so, so available asymptomatically and it's so widespread in the world, and we're not doing everything, everything we can to try to control it. So really, we've given the virus an open playing field to say, go for it. So in that case, I think our value is, is not as meaningful because now the, the virus um, is, um, there's an, another value people call theta, which is how many people can get infected from an asymptomatic, how much of infection comes from asymptomatic infection, right? And that may overcome a, a low R value because now if it's, I'm asymptomatic and I'm walking around and talking to lots of people. It doesn't matter if I can infect one at a time. Over two or three days, I might infect 50 if I don't know I have the virus. So that's kind of, I, I know those are complicated um, epidemiological terms, but it's basically one is the capacity of the virus and the other is, is, is how much of it actually easily get, how easily it gets spread or how asymptomatically it gets spread. Um, so um, I'll just I'll just pick a couple of these if you all don't mind. Um, would immunocompromised individuals be able to take the vaccines currently tested? I, yes, the answer is yes because these are not live virus vaccines. They are um, they're vaccines that are they they take the 
that protein on the surface of the cell that I mentioned, the spike protein that binds to the cell receptors. I'll just I'll just go back and share it again if y'all don't mind. Um, where did my where did my virus schema go? I must have deleted. Oh, there it is. Okay, I might share this again. Um, okay. So this uh, virus particle here, showing that cro cor corona or crown of spikes uh, that it that it's called. Um, this little pink protein on the surface called the spike protein, that by itself is able to induce immunity. So the vaccines that are being made take the, the genetic coding information for that spike protein, and they express it from a different a different way. And they do it uh, by several different strategies um, that aren't it's not so critical for us to understand right now. But that protein by itself is able to induce immunity. So, th so the vaccines that are are being um, that are being made, most of them just express that protein. So, I, I told you I felt I thought I got the vaccine and I felt really lousy. That was because of my response to the vaccine and the spike protein, not the virus. I wasn't infected with the virus. So, this vaccine could be given to people who have underlying conditions, who are uh, immune compromised, who are elderly. Um, all of those things are are possible and and uh, and and would be would be useful. So the, the answer is yes. That I would not um, it personally for anybody I know in my family or anybody I would say that I had no I had no significant concerns with anybody whether they were what no matter what their age or their immune status for for being um, for being in line to get a vaccine if it became available. Um, Aren't we got a, a huge population of families with children? Yeah. And I'd like to bring you back up to Ellie's question. Sure. Uh, simply because there, as you know, there's so much debate about sending children to school, keeping them home. Yeah. Uh, could you talk about COVID's impact on children? Benefits well, and risks. Yeah, you can imagine there's a, thousands of studies. I'm having trouble keeping up, and some of my colleagues here who do more clinical uh, care are doing good. Um, there's so can children get infected? Yes. Can they sh they spread it? Yes. There's, um, and I, I need to review these articles more carefully, but it looks more like um, children can get infected. They can have serious illness. We, we've seen that in children. There's one um, sort of what's called a post-COVID complication that's called MISC or multi-system inflammatory syndrome of children that um, looks like Kawasaki disease. It's, a, it's an inflammatory process that's, that's serious, can lead to hospitalization and, and heart damage but it's treatable um, and, and we can prevent the complications of it. For the most part, pediatric diseases, um, are, we've been not really impacted as PEDS ID. We may have one or two kids, typically they're adolescents and or they have a, some other underlying problems before they come in the hospital. So um, children being in school, the risk to the children is for infection is real. It seems to be less and the probability of serious infection is seems to be much, much less. The question is, do they then act as significant vectors um, that I think that, that there's data emerging that if, if it's people are managing this right and they're recognizing infections, that in fact, the risk of, of being in school or having schools open may not be substantially substantial drivers of maintenance of the epidemic. Um, that still needs to be, you know, verified. But it, it suggests that if, as, as or if this continues, that there that there may be need to be, and it may be appropriate to have ways to think about that that kids can be back in school environment where they need to be. Um, so I I hope that that I hope that holds up, and I I hope I hope there'll be more data that that shows that children, although they can get infected that the probability of a serious infection is extremely low and that they're actually not acting as really significant vectors for maintaining it. There's some, there's some, <laughs> you know, one interesting thing in the spring was when the, the masks went in place and the, and the, um, and the children were at home that the two spring flu, the two spring infections that are very serious can be very serious in kids, influenza and, um, and what's called RSV or respiratory syncytial virus, which is, very can be very dramatic in children under the age of one, but can affect children and keep them out of school. Those are our surveillance and the studies that were being done here on those viruses. Those viruses just dropped off the cliff. They just disappeared. 
because of the, the factors that were put in place to control COVID. So in fact, we, we learned that social distancing and masking and, and stopping school temporarily can dramatically abort a, an epidemic of flu or RSV. Um, so, so I think we know a little bit more about that. Um, We're into the ethics of vaccine distribution. Yeah, so um, there's a couple of questions about that. Um, would immunocompromised you know, get them? Are there more than one vaccine? And how will people decide which gets one? Um, well, they were not, they're not going to ask me. Um, <laughs> I do the basic biology of the virus, and I'd, I'd like to spend a few minutes on that maybe after this question. Um, if there's more than one vaccine, how do they decide who, who gets which one? I think that there, this, these are profound ethical questions, which I, I hope are being left to the scientists, ethicists, epidemiologists, and public health uh, people to make these decisions, and that these won't be uh, primarily politically driven. Um, if you were thinking of populations that you wanted to, you would like to talk. You would like to start with those that are most vulnerable and likely to transmit, and those who are most at risk. And I think that this is really where our, our humanity and our ethics uh, and our faith come in. Is really those most who's most vulnerable, and where would we like to be able to help people? I think about uh, extended care facilities. I think about the elderly. Um, every life, every year of life is precious, and we shouldn't be making decisions about. Uh, based on um, based on a sense of someone's you know social uh, social value of uh, someone else's perception of social value we should be looking at the most vulnerable populations and also those that are most at risk and need to be protected um, those first responders etc cetera, etc cetera. now this is just some broad comment I'm not involved in these discussions and then I think um, we need to think about the ethics of having this available worldwide and not just targeted to one particular population or those who can afford it. So there's lots of groups that are trying to work on that now so that there's, these questions don't arise later and that the distribution and the cost and the availability is so that we can begin to think about helping the whole world and not just ourselves. And uh, you know, these, these come back to faith issues as well. Um, so um, I think that that's, those are some of the factors that are weighed, weighed into it. Obviously, you need to have some management of, of cost and huge amounts of money are being given to people to think about the manufacture and distribution. There will be multiple vaccines. My opinion is there's likely to be multiple ones that are actually useful. And in some cases, it may be that you want to get one vaccine as a primary vaccine and the other one is a boost because they may present the, the virus a protein in different ways that actually may boost your immunity. Um, um, can you address vaccine? Um, so I want to take just, a, I'll come back to these. I want to take just a, a couple of minutes and tell you, because um, because Heidi asked me to, a little bit about my background and what we did. Um, we, um, I, I started working in this, like I said, in 1984. I think when I started, I couldn't spell pipette, let alone hold one. I didn't know anything about research. And this started from a perspective. And, and, and I was working with another scientist my mentor, Stan Perlman, who was working on coronaviruses to try to understand how they cause disease in mice as a model for multiple sclerosis, actually, because they cause CNS disease in the mice model. And I started working on this project to try to understand a little bit about the proteins the virus made. Well, to make a, a very, very long story, very hopefully very short, um, I was began fascinated by the unique biological characteristics of the virus and began studying it. So for over the first 20 years, my fellowship and my first faculty positions. I spent time really trying to understand how the virus got into a cell and how it damaged the cell and then how it caused disease and trying to find targets that we could use to potentially stop those diseases that occurred and actually in agricultural animals because they're so devastating in pigs and swine and cattle and dogs and cats. So that was something that was interesting to me as well. As a fact, these were also pediatric diseases and respiratory diseases that caused about 30% of common colds. And so when the SARS epidemic occurred in 2004, I, um, Laura will remember, I tell the story that we were down in Florida. I don't remember exactly how it happened, but basically in 2003 spring, early spring, when we were on the beach and I'm bemoaning the, the, the challenges of being one of the maybe five labs in the world that was studying coronaviruses, uh, when one of my colleagues came, or I was called for the, to the hotel that one of my colleagues was trying to reach me on the phone, that the virus in, in in Hong Kong was a new coronavirus and that was SARS. So over the next 20 years then, between then and now, following that and, and the MERS epidemic and our work, 
we began to focus more on how could we how could we use some of what we'd learned about the biology as targets with the understanding that these viruses were going to reemerge and were going to cause pandemic disease. With all the barriers we faced to doing that, uh, limited resource funding after the SARS epidemic went away, um, with, with biocontainment things where they made SARS an agent that required very, very high social security and, um, and biosafety components and limited the kinds of experiments that we could do. We still were working on trying to find antivirals. And then starting in about 2013, we, um, we began specifically testing. We, we, our, my laboratory made a discovery of a, of a novel protein function in coronaviruses um, that no other RNA virus has, that they're able actually to, to fix mistakes that they make and so that they're able to really fight off certain kinds of drugs. So we started studying those. And so two of the drugs, in, in, so the upshot of that is um, over a seven year period, we studied two drugs that we basically published in 2019, in the fall of 2019, that um, one is called remdesivir. Um, we didn't discover it, it's a Gilead drug, but we did all of the preclinical testing, meaning all the laboratory testing and culture and in animals that showed that it worked. And the other one is another one that's in phase three trial right now called EIDD2801. These were the only, the first two drugs that were shown to have activity against coronaviruses, and both of them have moved forward into human trials. So that's a really unique and unusual situation. Mm -hmm. We're very proud of that, but we also know that we need to keep doing that work. So we're continuing now to study other enzymes, other drugs, other targets that people send to us. We're looking at drugs in combination. We're looking at how we can prevent people from developing resistance to those drugs. And we're working with uh, pharma, with the NIH, with multiple companies to try to understand and study that. So that's the ongoing work that we do. Um, this gets around to um, this gets around to the questions about about immunity and, and mutations. Um, that is, um, so I, I guess I, sorry, I'm being a little random. No, this is wonderful. I guess I could comment. Um, on the issues of sort of persistence. <laughs> this is where I think a faith and persistence issue comes in. Um, it's hard. I, I, I think Laura would, it, it may have been harder on her than it's been on me because I was directly able to deal with some of these issues. But I think over the years to um, be told very directly by people high up in science and stuff is, you know, you're, you're okay scientist, you're doing okay. Why don't you work on something important? Uh, why don't you go and pick a virus? Direct, that's, those are almost direct quotes. Why don't you go and pick a virus that might impact human beings, might have a disease? And so I think between me and my colleagues, to be able to sit, it was a different kind of faith. I think it was both my, you know, my faith in God, but also my, my, my sense of um, the discoveries that we'd made and our understanding of them and trying to get people to understand those, that this these viruses had this potential that we had to be prepared that this was going to happen again and that we had to continue to try to argue and fight and 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 justify our existence over and over again and watching uh, viruses like influenza and hiv that were getting dramatic and consistent funding um, higher visibility at national levels and international levels i'd say it's it hard um, no question about it um, but the biology always captivated. I call it the uh, terrible beauty of these viruses. Their, their, their amazing capacity for adaptation and evolutionary movement um, com continue to compel me and my team enough that we wanted to just keep going um, with a couple colleagues and collaborators that we had. So I guess that's kind of the, the, the sense of, of, of commitment to a, a mission. It's felt a little more like a mission over the years, and certainly now it does in terms of keeping that going. So I know I, I don't have too much more time, but I, I see a lot of uh, different uh, questions here. Um, um, I could address the issue of virus mutation because that's important and something we study. So you know you have to get a flu shot every year, right? Why do you do that? Well, because the virus, flu viruses have a unique, a pretty much unique capacity for rapid escape from antibodies that we make. And it's most usually it's a subtle escape, so we still have some protective immunity. But the virus, I, the vaccine I get in 2020, may or may not protect me from one of the three or four circulating influenza strains in 2021, because as the virus is exposed to those antibodies, 
mutations that naturally arise may make that virus able to escape from that from that those antibodies. Coronaviruses typically haven't shown that kind of uh, rapid mutation and change over time. However, there's never been a brand new one in humans, and at least in, in known human history, that we've studied. And so we don't know yet what the response of the virus will be to vaccines. Um, we know that in our, our lab, when we use an antiviral drug like remdesivir, that if we passage the virus in remdesivir, we see mutations in a short period of time. Those viruses are typically wimpy and don't grow well and don't cause, don't cause disease in animals. And so those mutations are detrimental to the virus. So the thing that needs to escape from the antiviral causes the virus to be wimpy and not able to grow. So we would hope that that would be the case with viruses that escape from the, from the vaccine. And typically, that's why we also need to be looking now at, at the pathways the virus uses to escape from vaccines. So we can think about the second generation of vaccines that would be ready in case that occurs. So it's a complicated process, but it's, we have to know what the virus is going to do. We have to test it and then we have to prepare for it so that um, as enough people get immunized around the world that we don't suddenly see a virus emerge that's now able to grow even in the presence of the vaccine. I, I tend to worry that I scare people to death when I give these talks um, because uh, I think knowledge is good. I think we should have it anyway. Um, the virus is, is terrible. It has a lot of tools at its disposal, um, but we, have the under we, we, we know enough and we will know more that will, should allow us to prepare as long as we're allowed to, and as long as there's the will to try to do this the right way and be led by the science and the public health initiatives. Um, let's see. Um, um, I just, here's another pediatric one I'll answer. Do, do we know if a baby born of an infected mother will have COVID? We've had several moms who've been infected in, in pregnancy and sometimes their babies get infected shortly after birth but we've had no ill no ill newborns so no ill newborns and actually no uh, significantly ill uh, uh, pregnant women uh, that i'm aware of i don't know all the people who've come in i haven't been following all the clinical stuff but um but we don't have any evidence that this is a profoundly serious or increasingly risky virus for 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 pregnant women or those who are delivering or for their new, newborns which is good news we're we breathe a lot of sighs of relief as pediatricians in terms of the risks associated with that. Um, I know we're running short on time, but any um, other things people can open up and ask me questions if they want or other questions they have. Mark, you've got a question here from Ken Handy. A uh, couple layers of questions. What part of the genetic material, again, a medical term some of us don't know, is the yeah. PCR for COVID directed? And then the question about false positives and asymptomatic patients mm. and then COVID-19 and other coronaviruses gene overlaps. Three yeah, um, yeah, just a real, I think some real simple answers for that. There's not, um, it looks like the, the, the virus, the test is fairly, is specific enough, meaning that it's going to find COVID and not other coronaviruses. A false positive means that uh, uh, you get a test that's positive when it's not really positive. Um, any good test should work. Uh, any good test should have false positives because if, if, it's, if it doesn't have a few of those, it's not sensitive enough to pick up all the real ones. And what you don't want to do is you don't want to miss the real viruses, right? So false positive means the test comes back positive, but you don't really have the virus infection. And there are those, those do occur and those should require repeat testing. Those can be technical, they can be biological, they might be another, they potentially might be another coronavirus, but that means the person doesn't have COVID. So those are problematic for the person that gets them and for contact tracing. That's less serious than a false negative, right? Than if you had someone who has the infection, but the test is negative. So that's just a, an intrinsic component of the test. Um, it detects a specific gene uh, or two in the, in the virus and different PCR tests are being developed to, to detect different parts of the genetic material. Um, and so uh, it, there's always gonna be a challenge, I think until we have second and third generation tests that overlap and are able to give us confirmation. There's gonna be some problems of false positives and of false negatives. So far with people who are symptomatic, I think a false negative, meaning a negative test in someone who's symptomatic, I think it'd be highly unlikely at this point. You tend to get more false positives if you have almost nobody who's infected in the community and you test a bunch of people, then, then, then false positives are more likely because your prevalence of your disease is low. That's complicated, but I, I think that um, I, I, that's kind of the way I think about it. 
Mark, I uh, wonder what you would say to us as we continue to, to journey in faith, as you too journey in faith as a doctor, uh, as a Christian and Presbyterian elder, as a medical researcher, what would you say to us as we have heard all of this, you worried about overwhelming us, you worried about scaring us, <laughs> but we live in this world with you. What, what would you say to us as we go forth? Uh, I ponder that a lot. I, 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 I have um, for, for multiple reasons. One is because I've been working with these viruses so long and two, as I'm getting older, I have less wisdom than I used to have. I was actually an elder at a young age and haven't done it again in a while. <laughs> I was a young elder, so I don't, <laughs> I probably thought I knew a lot more. I was probably a lot wiser then, or at least I thought I was a lot wiser then than I am now. Um, uh, I would, I think we're going to have to live through this. You know, it's a um, book we read to our kids going on a bear hunt growing up. We can't go over it. We can't go around it. We can't avoid it. We can't wish it away. Um, we are in a unique time. It's, it's odd that this is overlapping with such a, 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 a fraught time politically and socially for so many other reasons. Um, it is odd, isn't it? And I tried to think about that from a prayer perspective. Um, I, I think that viruses are... I, I think they're not inflicted upon us. You know, they're not a judgment. They're biological entities that have no agency. They don't think, they don't care, but they do uncover and reveal so many of our areas where we as humans are impacting it, whether it's our social interactions, our interactions with others, our love and faith for others, our protection for the most vulnerable, our our sense of justice and equity in terms of distribution of resources, um, who gets the resources and how are they best used. I think we're in this for many years um, in different ways. And the question is, is how do we do something that isn't easily solved? It's not science fiction. It's not a one hour television show. It's not a two hour movie where someone finds the answer um, because the virus doesn't care about that. And so we have to care and, and I think our faith and our, our relationships with the other come in about how we respond and, and what we do for those around us um, who, are the, who are the most at risk while we work hard to try to find answers that will allow us to move back to some form of normalcy. Um, I find that a very unsatisfying answer, as I'm sure you do, but it's the best that I can, it's the best that I can do at the moment. <laughs> Mark, we are deeply grateful that as that uh, phrase came into parlance and in what was it the last year, I'll use it for you. Nevertheless, he <laughs> persisted yeah. and he continues to persist. We yeah. are deeply grateful for your presence among us this day. Well, I could use your, um, I, I could tell you that it's, um, there are interestingly new barriers being erected for our work ironically because of the of the how vi how visible and high impact all of the work that we did all these years suddenly is so i could use prayers for that for my team um that are you know they've been here they come in here every day and they have been more isolated even from their families because um they know that if they get sick and the people in our lab get get this at all that it shuts down our work and so um They've, I think, made sacrifices, and and so if it's prayers for anything, it's for that, for their their ability to maintain their just commitment to to maintain their their health and their well being. As for all of us, that that's no different prayer, but uh, but if it's targeted our way, that would be it, and that we could um, that we could continue to just um, uh, persevere in in trying uh, new efforts um, to to find new ways to interfere with this and, and new new antivirals to. to to help those who are ill. Friends, will you all join me in praying that prayer for mm -hmm. Mark and his team? Let us pray together and pray ourselves on. Oh, gracious God, you led the Hebrew people through a very uncertain time. The wilderness, the exodus, but they were en route to the promised land. Here we are now without answers, but some coming without certainties, but yet with people like Mark and his lab who are persisting nevertheless. 
We pray, oh God, that the new barriers that are being erected against their work, which is for humankind, God, and especially for the most vulnerable among us, we pray for a lifting of those barriers. We pray for the strength and the faith and the hope for Mark and his team and for all teams all over the world seeking to crack into new understanding that will make a difference for human well-being, that will protect the vulnerable and enable all of us, oh God, to, to follow the prophet Micah and Jesus Christ in loving you, in living with kindness, in doing justice, loving others, and walking humbly with you, oh God. That's Thank, you. Thank you, God. Thank you for Mark. Thank you for this day. We join together in this prayer. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. If you all have questions that you didn't um, get to put into words today, please email them to Heidi or myself, Sylvia or Glenn Davidson. We're using those questions to help format the last two sessions that we're doing on transformation. And next week, Heidi is going to be leading us through the biblical narratives, the plague and pandemics through um and if you get a chance this book by walter brueggemann virus is a summons to faith biblical reflections in a time of loss grief and anxiety you can get it on amazon but a lot of uh what heidi will be covering can be uh you'll get a good gra grasp of it if you get a chance to read this very thin little virus book something. it's called the virus is a summons to faith Alice Biblical Summons Reflections in a Time of Alice Loss, Summons Grief, Faith. and Anxiety by Walter Brueggemann. Mm -hmm. And then there's another book that came out in 1978. I wish I had the cover. Um, it's like Game of Thrones, but with the Black Death thrown in. And it's a history called It's a Distant Mirror. And it so mirrors our yeah, yeah. calamitous 14th century is a lot like our calamitous 21st century. It's all about political intrigue and crusade and church schisms and, and, and pandemic. So that's another. And it's by Barbara Tuckman, T-U-C-H-M-A-N. So thank you all. And I'll look, we'll look forward to um, any questions you want to send us because that will help us in our last two sessions. Thanks again.